I'm going to introduce um, our panelists for the next session, um, David Belson. Uh, David Belson is um, the Senior Director of Internet Research and Analysis at the Internet Society, and he is focused there on efforts around internet measurement, shutdowns, um, understanding market trends, and, and the impact of the growth of the internet across the globe. And before joining um, Internet Society, David had a very similar role with Oracle's Internet Intelligence team. And prior to that, um, he spent over 18 years in Akamai, um, and uh, some of you are probably familiar with David's name from the State of the Internet report, which is Akamai's you know, quarterly um, report series um, that he was kind of um, uh, leading there. So with that, David, I'm going to pass it on to you. Um, Great, Arkana. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, next slide. There we go. Um, so uh, over the next half hour, uh, I'm, I'm uh, privileged to uh, be leading a panel to talk about internet resiliency during COVID-19. Uh, it's a really interesting topic, and it's, it's something that has really come to the forefront uh, in, for, for, for so many of us uh, over the last several months. Um, next slide. So in late February, uh, early March, uh, there was a lot of uh, virtual ink spilled uh, as, as everybody uh, started to work from home and everybody was locked down uh, around concerns that the internet might break. Uh, was all of the increased traffic and the associated uh, latency going to cause a lot of problems? Uh, was it uh, you know, going to really slow things down? Was it really gonna make, uh, make it hard to, to watch Netflix videos or to do Zoom conferences or what have you? Uh, so a lot of articles out there. Here's a sample of a few of them. Uh, and in late February, I had uh, published a blog post on the Internet Society blog uh, called, Is the Internet Resilient Enough to Withstand Coronavirus? Uh, taking a look at uh, some of the metrics that we needed to watch uh, and see what happened. Next slide. Uh, so after a month or so, uh, it was became pretty clear that uh, the internet was not going to break. Uh, it was able to withstand the strain. It was able to withstand the uh, the increased traffic, uh, and and I, I published a follow up post that said, "Yep, uh, you know the internet is resilient enough, uh, but there is a catch, and, and and that catch was more related to the digital divide, which is a topic for a, a separate webinar." Uh, but, but what we're really here today is, is to talk about uh, how and, and why the internet was resilient and, and how it managed to, uh, to, uh, to, to stay up uh, and, and problem, largely problem-free um, over the last several months. Next slide. So one key reason uh, that the internet was so resilient or is so resilient uh, is because it's a network of networks. Uh, there's no single monolithic uh, internet for the, to, to break. Uh, it's a combination of tens of thousands of, of different types of interconnected networks, uh, mobile providers, last mile providers, backbone networks, academic networks, enterprise networks, internet exchange points, CDM providers, and, and so on. And uh, to, to talk about that today, I've got uh, three panelists um, representing uh, an IXP, a content delivery network, and a uh, last mile community network provider. Um, so, uh, Jim Troutman, uh, director at Nenix, Jaya Iyengar, uh, distinguished engineer at Fastly, and Scott Rasmussen, uh, a business development and strategic partnership representative from New York City Mesh. Uh, so, Jim, do uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello and good day to all of you in whichever time zone you're attending from. Uh, my name is Jim Troutman. I'm a volunteer director and uh, general purpose agitator for Nenix. We're a small not-for-profit internet exchange serving Northern New England, which is Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, if you're not familiar. Uh, in our very rural region, Nenix tries to foster and promote an, uh, increased internet resiliency and connectivity, higher broadband speeds at lower costs. In our region, it's still common for wholesale internet transit costs to exceed $5 per megabit per month. And there are still large areas where residential broadband is limited to low speed DSL if it's available at all. My day job is an independent internet infrastructure consultant and IT architect. And I work with a variety of regional ISPs, telcos and enterprises to help solve their problems. Cool, thank you, Jim. Um, Johnny, you wanna give a quick intro? Sure, um, thank you. Um, 
for bringing me in here, David. Uh, well, my name is uh, Jana Iyengar, and I am uh, a distinguished engineer in the CTO's office at Fastly. Uh, can you put the first slide up, please? So yeah, so I work on a number of things, um, but primarily on on Quick, which we won't be talking about here. Um, but uh, Fastly, uh, as a uh, CDN company, it's, it's basically what we call as a um, uh, an edge cloud uh, platform, which basically means that we have a distributed system that's sitting. We have machines sitting all over the world, and we offer storage as well as compute uh, from those machines. And so you do also perform the services of a traditional CDN. And uh, the data that I'll be showing you today comes from a number of our customers that use the uh, CDN there. Uh, and, and finally, Scott, uh, you want to give a quick intro uh, to New York City Mesh? Sure, absolutely. My name's Scott. I'm an organizer with NYC Mesh. Uh, as you mentioned, David, we're a community network based in New York. We connect about 500 buildings across the city. We're a nonprofit, and we believe that the internet is for everyone. Um, so we have volunteers that build out our network. We're entirely run by volunteers and the people who own um, our network. And together we engage in popular education, network infrastructure building, and other sorts of activities needed to make sure that uh, we can connect connect New Yorkers no matter what their home looks like or what they're able to afford. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so to today we want to look at resilience uh, within the panel uh, in three different areas. Uh, one is, is from a traffic perspective, uh, one is from uh, the challenges, uh, so what challenges were faced, and then uh, looking towards the future and looking at how we remain resilient. Uh, so the question for, excuse me, first question that I have for the panelists uh, is what their traffic levels were like uh, heading into the March lockdowns and how they changed uh, as a result of the lockdowns being implemented. So, so Jim, let's uh, let's let's look at you first for Nenex and and for the uh, the IXP community. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Nenex, we saw um, quite a quite a large traffic increase. Uh, we are small. We have a, a small number of peers, but we had approximately a, like a more than a two x uh, doubling of traffic um, around the world and in general for IXPs that I've uh, talked with and, and monitored everyone saw between 30 to 50% traffic increase uh, during the lockdown. Uh, a lot of the IXs ended up deploying uh, an entire year's worth of bandwidth upgrades and planned expansions in a matter of a month or two, oh. uh, just to be able to keep up with demand. Great. And um, Jenna, what about uh, Fastly? What kind of uh, traffic increases did Fastly see? Yeah, so I have some data to show if we can get the the first fastly the not the fastly slide but the data slide up. Um, we definitely saw increases, um, and we actually published a blog post about this in I can't remember, May it was. So basically, one of the things that you see here is 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 that um, so there's a lot going on in this slide, and this is basically one of the uh, uh, deep dive slides. So I won't go into detail here, just. Very broadly speaking, what we tried to do was we looked at internet traffic uh, at, at our, uh, um, uh, from our POPs, we looked at how traffic volume was increasing and how what we measured as download speed, we basically measured at our servers, we were measuring TCP delivery rate. And we measured that as a proxy for what download speed users were experiencing. Um, and uh, we looked at how that, what happened to that when, uh, um, when those connections were going to particular parts of the world. And so this one is looking at just New York and New Jersey. The red curve that you see there is basically the, the hockey stick. Um, um, unfortunate COVID uh, cases increased uh, that happened over time. The blue curve that you see rising up slowly is the traffic level increase that we saw in traffic going to New York and New Jersey, that region of the world. And the green curve down below that's decreasing, these are all percentage changes from just an arbitrary point. Um, that shows download speed as we measured it. Now, you can see that traffic levels are definitely increasing. And, um, um, and, and as a result, we saw some of the download speed decrease, but it didn't completely go down. It went down at a much lower rate than the traffic increases. And we also see that it's sort of, you know, towards the end, there's some recuperation, there's some improvement happening there on the download speed, despite the fact that traffic increases continued to happen through the end of March. Can you go to the next slide? 
that was, was really good to see then from a, a the, the fact that the download speeds didn't sh sh drop significantly, I think was certainly speaks to the resilience of the network infrastructure in that area. Absolutely. And that's that's something that we saw repeatedly. So if you see the next slide, you'll see a similar trend again. Uh, this was in Italy. Again, you see a similar trend. I won't go into the details of various events there. Um, the next slide shows you uh, the UK. Can you get to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this shows the UK and you see similar trends. A couple of things I'll note because uh, they're interesting, I think. One of the things is that we saw a we saw dramatic increases in traffic as school closures were announced or you know, kids went to school, went, went home basically because as children go home, parents go home, everybody goes home and uh, the traffic that we saw increased and presumably this was mostly residential, increased in residential areas. We didn't really dig into that much. But you also see that you see these nice bumps in the UK. Those are weekend bumps uh -huh. and those disappear. Yeah, those disappear completely. So yeah, that was definitely is, that was something I saw elsewhere as well. Uh, the comments from other network providers that uh, the weekend sh shifts that you normally saw in their traffic went away. It's uh, really interesting. So so thank you. Um, and and so now that we're you know three months on, three or four months on from the lockdown orders, and school is over. Uh, you know, right here we're starting to talk about going back to school. Businesses are gradually starting to reopen. Um, some of the traffic graphs I've seen out there uh, show that the, the peaks are, are kind of back around pre-lockdown uh, levels. Uh, you know, so so where are your traffic levels at these days? And, and Jenna, I know you guys are a public company. Don't want to get you in trouble with anybody, so I'll give you a pass on this question. <laughs> but Scott and Jim, if you can, uh, you know, say a few words on on where your you know the, the traffic levels that you're seeing uh, now that things are are you know now that we're a quarter on. Absolutely. Well, I, we're a wireless network for the most part. Um, and prior to COVID, we were seeing generally when we do the back of the envelope math to figure out how much bandwidth we need in a particular area or backhaul, we generally average about two megabits per second per unit throughout the day. And that's kind of the average that we can operate with that peaked at about four, four and a half megabits per second per day. So we more than doubled, um, kind of usage of our network on daily basis. And then uh, now it's 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 settled back down to about three or so. So we really saw really in the first week or two an incredible peak of traffic, um, a lot of emergencies for us and our volunteers, but then things have actually gradually lowered um, uh, as, as not only our network kind of optimized itself to be able to meet, you know, increased demand, but also I think as, as, as things have changed, particularly probably school ending in New York City. Uh, can I get my s slides with uh, the uh, statistics page? Um, most of the IXs uh, have seen a little bit of a decrease in traffic. It's not uh, back down to normal levels uh, or levels pre-COVID because just the growth of internet traffic is, is you know, always happens. So you can see long-term trends at various IXs around the world. Um, this would, these graphs are from the start of uh, the COVID period, but uh, traffic levels have come down a bit as lockdowns are ending. Um, on my non-IX work on the retail ISP side, uh, definitely seen that as well. And it's interesting, Scott, that you know what I see in our very rural area is more like half a megabit to one megabit per user instead of two to four. And that's simply because the access last mile isn't there, unfortunately. Sounds like there's an opportunity for a main mesh up there, Scott. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we're all in, we're ready. <laughs> yeah. we Good area up there. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And I just wanted to touch on the shape and the, the difference during COVID. Uh, that the bottom left there shows a typical period highlighted. And then during lockdown, the shape of traffic changed. It was basically kind of an all day peak with a, a little bit of bumps. Uh, another thing that was interesting, uh, particularly in the IX world is a lot of the large academic networks, like a lot of the K-12 and university networks, um, they were basically ghost towns during lockdown. However, they basically became content providers because a lot of people were accessing content and uh, educational things uh, that they provide. 
So it was an interesting uh, role reversal, and that graph on the right side shows that. Yeah, and you know, in, interesting with with respect to the the K twelve networks, um, and I don't know if you have any visibility into this, but you know, there were a lot of stories about in, in certain parts of, of the U S. at least uh, where students were with that students without network connectivity at home were were basically sitting outside. Absolutely. Um, there was a whole uh, network from car uh, work uh, homework from car initiative in yep. Maine. Uh, the oh, the Maine folks at, at Network Maine they actually worked with a lot of the K twelve schools specifically to open up Wi Fi hotspots and to get people to come in during uh, the lockdown and like move access points close to a window that sort of thing just to get some sort of connectivity because there's literally you know, thousands and thousands of kids that were in lockdown that didn't have internet access at all. Yeah, and and, and that's where the resilience failed. Uh, absolutely. But um, and which I think is actually a good segue to the to the challenges question. Um, so, were there specific challenges that that your organization or infrastructure um, faced related to the, the COVID driven increased usage? Um, you know, Jenna, um, as a, a CDM provider, I'm you know I'm sure you guys are. Uh, you know, very used to, to sudden peaks in traffic, but can you speak to, you know, any of the challenges that Fastly saw? Yeah, so this is um, this is basically what we what we do, right? I mean, it's 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 our job to handle these things, and and we were able to manage it. And as you saw in the graphs and in various graphs that we're seeing, basically, and as as David you said right at the beginning of this uh, panel as well, uh, it was it was you know another day, another sort of sustained peak that we saw for a while and we were able to we were able to uh, take it in our stride um this is you know you know i, I would I want to say that this is, yes for fastly it definitely was something that we do that something that we could add and so we were able to do this but at the same time it also speaks to the value of a lot of innovation that's happened in the industry over the past 10 15 years i don't know if you could have really survived this you know 20 years ago um 15 years Very ago true. Uh, and and uh, one of my my dear friends and colleagues, Patrick McManus, wrote a blog post about this, about basically the four key innovations that has uh, that has allowed us to to be resilient during this time. And I think it's important to recognize the value of all of these things. The standards and the specs of the internet are also designed uh, for reliability, for elasticity, for resilience. And so we continue to build those standards, and they've been tested, and I think they've held up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. And uh, Scott, can you speak to um, New York City Mesh? Sure. Um, I think our, our biggest challenges were were twofold. One centered on kind of human capacity. In New York, we were under the lockdown. So things like maintenance and the very basic types of things of getting across New York City, a city where most people don't own a car and you're dependent on public transportation or anything else to schlep equipment across town. Uh, and, and, and nobody was rushing to the New York City subway. Yeah, in the middle yeah of the exactly, exactly. And so we can talk a little bit more about that later. But um, the issue of kind of human capacity and what we were able to do was was significantly limited and something that was trying for us. The other was spectrum. Um, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. we're a wireless network. New York is a very, very busy space in the uh, radio frequency environment. You know, not only do we have three airports that we're operating around, but we have a lot of other users. Um, and something that we found is that a lot more folks were jumping around channels trying to find, you know, open opportunities or spaces that they could operate in to kind of increase bandwidth and meet those needs um, that we saw immediately after the lockdowns. And as that happens, obviously, then that starts a chain reaction of 10 other users of Spectrum that are suddenly reshuffling around and moving around. So we had to be incredibly dynamic in our use. Um, and interestingly, in many ways, uh, it often got down to, again, a human question. Um, we really had RF engineers watching and looking and actually selecting, manually selecting channels in which to operate in because in many cases, things were moving in some cases too quickly to be able to kind of leave it up to, to, to you know, uh, uh, automatically kind of selecting channels. Um, you know, it actually took a lot of human judgment to figure out what was best. Right. And that's, and that's and I guess as as a you know suburban user, I don't think about that much. Uh, my my stuff just works. And but but being in a really radio dense environment like New York City, 
that is definitely a unique challenge. And, and, and just building also on something that you mentioned there, uh, you know, talking about having the, the human capacity and, and really relying on the human element. Uh, my colleague, Jane Coffin, likes to talk about, you know, it's the human nets that build the net nets. And, and I think, you know, for you and, and for everything I've read about New York City Mesh, that really rings true. I think it's uh, very true for, our last, for the last mile provider. I mean, so much of our work is in the field and that mm -hmm. you have to be present and we have to be there to be able to do a lot of the maintenance, particularly in the wireless environment, I think. Yeah, and, and, and a lockdown and a pandemic sort of makes it a little bit more challenging to uh, to accomplish. Absolutely. Um, but but it's good to see that your subscribers are willing to, to share their knowledge and their experience with others. Uh, right, to help, absolutely. To help you get the job done. That's the benefit that we have being a community network. We're inclusive of everyone. We're not kind of providing a customer service in many ways. We try to increase technology across the board because we actually understand that our network is more resilient when skills and knowledge are shared across the user base. Um, so the more informed of users that we have on our network, the more resilient our network ultimately is. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Jim, can you speak to the uh, IXP industry and, and Enix? So uh, one of the th challenges that I saw across the ISP industry, as well as retail ISPs, was um, getting circuits delivered and capacity increases. Uh, there were a lot of IXs that waived port charges, uh, and basically because this was an emergency, they said, you know, if you need bandwidth, just tell us and we will give it to you and we will sort right. out the billing later. Um, and there was a lot of very fast uh, new capacity added in terms of additional ports or upgrades uh, to the next level speed. I also saw a lot of the telcos doing things they have never ever been able to do before where they were turning around circuits that would normally take weeks or months and they were doing them in a matter of days uh, because everyone really you know understood that it was an emergency uh, some of the retail isps were caught short without enough transit capacity so there was a lot of additional transit orders uh, and definitely there were uh you know some new entrants into the world of peering uh, one of the things i wanted to point out that's still a problem is there's still insufficient peering, particularly when it comes to corporate VPN traffic versus home traffic. Uh, there's still way too many instances where your VPN traffic back to your office and, and a lot of people still have to do that. They're not all in the cloud. Uh, that traffic sometimes is going hundreds of miles or thousands of miles uh, tromboning out of the next major market uh, because that's where the two entities peer. Uh, so more local peering, please. And what's the what's the impact of the, the trombone routing there? Um, increased latency, more packet loss, uh, slower VPN experience. I, I mean, people have adjusted and have, you know, gotten used to working from home primarily, and there's still a lot of people that are, and as, as everyone says, this is the new normal. Yep. But uh, if, if there was more peering, the uh, I think the VPN experience would be a lot nicer. Cool. And then just to, to close it out, talking about the future, um, you know, building on the points we, we've just made, um, do you feel your organizations and your infrastructure uh, is sufficiently resilient uh, in order to, to capably handle um, that next unexpected surge in traffic? Uh, you know, again, as, as, a, as a CDM provider, Jana, you know, the answer there is probably yes. But, um, you know, and, and I think one final question of, you know, is there a key lesson from the experiences in your organization over the last few months uh, that you're willing to share with with the industry and your industry colleagues. Um, so, so Scott, we'll start with you. Sure, absolutely. I'd say you know our network we scrape by uh, <laughs> as much as humanly possible because our our job uh, we're not only do we have a shoestring budget, but we also just our goal is to have a neutral network, and so we're not out here throttling data or anything like that. So we're we're trying to get everything we can out the door as quickly as possible with respect to, to bandwidth. Um, so with respect to our network and how it holds up, um, there were a lot of challenges. We're in the process right now of installing a lot better equipment, more larger antennas, things like that, and doing a lot of the back end maintenance work. We learned a lot from. From the process and uh but with respect to lessons learned i think i think two lessons really kind of came to mind and and thinking about this um 
The first is the importance of investing in human capacity. And that's the what I was mentioning earlier is, uh, you know, incredibly important for us. And we really, that's what the back end of so much of this is, is still run by network engineers and people doing the work on the ground. Um, and the other, I guess, is really thinking that the remote is all the rage and many of us, including myself, are all working from home these days. Um, local really is important. And we realized that and that we had to have people in the field local to where the problems existed. We couldn't have somebody, you know, for us taking subway across town wasn't a possibility. So we had to have groups of volunteers or people who are able to walk up the block or do something like yeah. that to be able to do that kind of maintenance. And I think also, you know, it gets to Jim's point earlier, I think also local is very true with respect to peering. Um, with the traffic going over our network, if we can keep a maximum amount of that traffic locally within the network or directly with somebody we're peering with at a local exchange, that makes a huge difference for, for end users. Um, so not only kind of having people and capacity local, but also traffic local. Absolutely. And um, Jim? Uh, I, I'll agree totally with Scott on the people and uh, in, in general. Um, Challenges is, uh, or you know, lessons learned. Uh, access to facilities is very important, and what right. a challenge during COVID uh, for different reasons uh, than you know some of Scott's reasons. Uh, a lot of the facilities were essentially unmanned, uh, or and and had severely restricted access, and and access was essentially by appointment only. Uh, a lot of data center facilities, and I know this affected other IXs, uh, those data centers maybe had one technician. And so getting remote hands requests was uh, <laughs> basically impossible or you had a very long wait. Yeah. Um, so those are, you know, issues for the future. Uh, and always yeah. more capacity, more peering, always going to say more peering. And ho hopefully a lot of organizations now are, are revisiting their disaster recovery plans and their, their disaster, you know, the, the, uh, Business, uh, the, business continuity. The, thank you. The business the DRBC plans and, and 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 you know incorporating things like what happens when there's only one guy in the data center. Yeah. What happens when we can't get into our data center? Uh, and maybe that's when we start relying more on CDN services. So so Jana, we'll uh, we'll close it out with you. Huh. Um, so yeah. So basically, like you said, you know, as a CDN, having a CDN helps, right? I mean, so I'm, my heart goes out to those who had to scale their services overnight, but didn't have that uh, to back them up. But um, so in terms of looking to the future, we've we've been investing in in, in infrastructure, in, in capacity. We recently announced that we've reached 100 terabits of, uh, right. uh, of, of serving capacity. Um, and more broadly around, around the internet, you know, we are, we want to build a technology that can continue, continue help us move forward like this. So we're investing in, in, in uh, technologies like Quick, various things that can actually help us move into the the sort of the next level of internet use, so to speak, um, and and to to manage these things. In terms of the um, lessons learned, I have uh, to say that there's, there's something resonates with me when 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 I heard uh, uh, Jim talk about how people stepped up to do stuff right here during during these times. Um, so we we just a very quick. Uh, uh, Preload is that we dug into the data that I showed you earlier to see if different communities were getting affected disproportionately. Specifically within the US, we tried to dig in and see if uh, um, poorer communities were getting more affected than uh, richer communities. And the way we did this, we looked at five, five digit zip codes, we looked at the average income from, from IRS data, and, and we correlated that with delivery rate to those particular zip codes. And while we didn't see a big uh, difference in how much they were affected. Uh, we what we found was quite stark in that we found that across the board, even before pre COVID, COVID um, um, delivery rates were completely striated. Like you know, the, the, the richest neighborhoods got the highest delivery rates, and the poorest neighborhoods got the lowest delivery rates, and it was perfectly stratified. We had five levels that we classified the five-digit zip codes into, and we got five curves of delivery rates, uh, and that was just very stark. The really cool thing is that operators have stepped up. Uh, they did step up. So Comcast and Cox Communications, I'll call them out because they did something really good here. They came out and they offered the Internet Basics uh, program for free 
uh, for a while and they also increased the bandwidth of those programs and that actually showed in our data. We saw these striations, like you know, we had these five lines and the bottom two sort of you know, went up and, 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 and the gap sort of disappeared uh, uh, for those ISPs at least. So the, the lesson here is that we can continue doing this. That is a digital divide. We know that there's disproportionate uh, um, uh, right. people who are getting disproportionately affected and that we as a community can actually step up and do something here. Uh, we can take right. that lesson out of this. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great point to end on. Um, you know, I think the, the internet has remained resilient um, thanks to the work of, of CDNs and last mile providers and IXPs. Um, I think that, that where we need to focus on um, improving the resilience uh, is by closing that digital divide. Uh, it's going to require a lot of work, a lot of investment. Uh, and, and it's going to require a lot of investment, not only in, in hardware and in um, uh, bandwidth, but also in human capacity. Uh, like like um, Jim and Scott said, you know, having the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, so I want to thank uh, Jim and Scott and Jana uh, for participating in the panel today. I want to thank the uh, team at Thousand Eyes for having us and uh, turn it back to Arkana and Angelique. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, in particular, the discussion around access um, and, and really paying attention to that in particular because, you know, as Jana mentioned, like some of these trends that they were seeing existed pre-COVID um, and even, you know, afterwards, and there were some providers who stepped up. But if anybody is interested in learning more about this, isn't that part of some of the work that um, the Internet Society is involved in? in Absolutely. Yeah, we, we uh, do a lot of work around uh, both community networks, uh, helping to, to foster and to build community networks around the world, uh, as well as uh, shepherding IXP deployments uh, in various locations, trying to help keep that traffic local. Uh, so the Internet Society website has a lot of information on uh, both project areas.